Welcome back to another team selection for FPL, this time out of game week three. I've got two free transfers and the possibilities are endless. I could make some key upgrades this week or even roll the transfer and have up to three going into the international break for game week four. So that's what I'm going to delve into in today's podcast, giving a review of game week two where the triple captaincy was very popular and also discuss my plans moving forwards because I've got a lot of issues in my team and even a wild card could solve a lot of these problems but the current plan isn't to use the chip right now i'm not going to completely discard it but ideally i would save the chip until later in the season smash the like button and subscribe for new if you enjoy my content let's try to get this video to the 200 likes and let's keep on pushing towards new goals like very fast subscribers check all the other links in the description below for my patron the championships discord server fpl league draft town as well as spotify but without further ado let's jump straight into it I don't recommend making early transfers in the goalkeeper position, but Dean Henderson is becoming a bit of a problem. Now, in the Carabao Cup, Crystal Palace won 4-0 against Norwich City, and Dean Henderson made three saves in that game, and several Crystal Palace assets looked very impressive. Despite the departure of Joachim Anderson to Fulham, I still think they can get a few good results in the next couple of weeks. Mark Gay is still heavily linked with Newcastle and Chaddy Riyad, one of their new signings, has picked up an injury, so they are a bit short at the back. I don't trust Crystal Palace defensively and it is Chelsea away next and Dean Henderson only got one point in game week two, a very disappointing performance, but I could still see one or two clean sheets over the next five game weeks and that is enough to hold him for now. Despite being sobbed off early in two consecutive games, I'm still very happy to hold Trent Alexander-Arnold. His reaction to being sobbed off wasn't great to see, but I still think he'll start against Man United and moving forward, so I don't see any real issues between him and Arnold's slot. It's natural for a player of that quality to be quite aggravated when he doesn't stay on the pitch, but Trent will still offer a lot of FPL returns, and I can see him starting and playing 90 minutes quite frequently this season, and overall Arnold's slot likes to change the fullbacks, at least one of them throughout the game so I don't think it's anything too personal you've also got Connor Bradley who's got so much potential who deserves game time but he kept the clean sheet in game week two nothing more than that in a 2-0 victory over Brentford he did pick up two bonus points in game week one though and that's what Trent offers above any other defender in FPL next up was Robinson who picked up two bonus points and an assist in a 2-1 victory over Leicester. So despite the disappointment of not keeping a clean sheet through Wat Fass's header, I'm still very happy with Robinson. And moving forwards, he justifies that 4.6 million price tag. Amongst budget defenders, he's probably the best option of the lot with the fixtures in mind, the attacking potential and the odd bonus points he can accumulate. But next up, is a four-point family defender in Lewis Hall who was benched against Bournemouth. He came on towards the end of the game and had a decent impact and they ended up salvaging a 1-1 draw at the Vitality Stadium. And I think he'll start against Tottenham, but it's never good to see an FPL asset benched, especially when you're short at the back already. And in my case, I've got Barco who's on loan to Sevilla, so he's going to be useless now for the rest of the season. And I've also got another defender who's gone down in price to 4.4 million after shipping four goals to Tottenham Hotspur in Mikalenko. Four of my five midfielders returned this week, including Diogo Jota, who got an assist for the first goal scored by Luis Diaz. And that's one goal and one assist across both games so far with decent underlying numbers. And he's playing down the middle. Darwin Nunez is currently linked with a move to Arsenal. And I don't really believe that whatsoever. I think we'll get plenty of game time for Liverpool this season should he stay at the club. And the same goes for Cody Gagpo. The biggest issue with Jota is will he stay fit? And he probably won't for the entire season. If he can do though, I could see him getting... Close to 200 FPL points, possibly even surpassing that. So it all depends on his fitness. But playing down the middle for Liverpool, he's going to do very well this season. And next up is Saka with another attack and return in that 2-0 victory over Aston Villa. And both Arsenal and Liverpool have been very impressive so far. I would say Liverpool have been a bit more impressive though in the opening two gimmicks of this season. And let's see how these trends continue. I still am a big fan of Liverpool's fixtures and not so much of Arsenal's facing Brighton at home and then Tottenham and Man City away after the international break. Then it gets very good for the Gunners with two back-to-back -back home games against newly promoted clubs in Leicester City and Southampton, followed by Bournemouth away. But then it's three difficult games against Chelsea, Liverpool and Newcastle. So things aren't too great for the Gunners to start this season. But Saka is still ticking along very nicely and he'll be right up there amongst the highest scoring FPL players. Now, third in my midfield is Emil Smith-Rowe, a former Gunner who scored his first goal for Fulham and got maximum bonus points in Gimmick 2. 
He also made a brief cameo in a 2-0 victory during midweek in the Carabao Cup, and I think he'll do very well this season. But just like Diogo Jota, his main issue is staying fit, and I really hope for his sake he can do so because he's a quality player with a lot of goal potential, and he can get the odd assist as well. And the next midfielder is Eze, who has been very disappointing in terms of FPL output, but the underlying numbers are incredible. And in midweek, Crystal Palace won 4-0 against Norwich, and Eze produced a goal and an assist, four shots, four key passes, and two big chances created, I believe. Some fantastic underlying numbers, and I think he's going to get some returns very soon in FPL. But I've got a big benching dilemma in game week three, and it could result in Eze dropping to the bench. The biggest mistake I made this week was starting Chris Wood, who missed two big chances and picked up a yellow card against Southampton. So maybe on the face of it, it wasn't a bad decision, but it was a bad outcome. I benched Anthony Gordon for this lad. That's a nine point swing and that could have resulted in me reaching 100 plus FPL points this week because I had a certain Erling Haaland who got a hat-trick against Ipswich Town and many people captained him. And then there were quite a substantial number who put the triple captaincy on the Norwegian. It was just a great fixture. He's in great form throughout pre-season and he carried that over to game week one. He looks very sharp and this could be another season where he scores over 30 Premier League goals. Maybe he'll break his own record which he set in his debut season. And my final forward was Isak. Very disappointing stuff here from him, especially considering the fact that I benched Anthony Gordon who scored the only goal for Newcastle and got maximum bonus points to deliver 10 overall. Despite benching Anthony Gordon, I got 93 FPL points this week, courtesy of that late triple captaincy on Erling Haaland, which you saw during the deadline stream. So that's 160 points overall, and my rank has gone up to 338,000. A great position to be in after two game weeks. I think I was in a similar position last season, but then I had a terrible spell between game weeks three to eight in the last campaign, which really made it difficult to get a good rank by the end of the season. But I'm looking to do much better this time round, of course, and see where the international break can take us. And I'm always the kind of manager who would like to have more information. And despite making some very impulsive moves at times, I think this season I'm going to change a bit my approach. I was very aggressive with the triple captaincy, but there is a time and place to be aggressive and also to be calculated. And that's where the five free transfers that you can now stack this season can really come into play. Let me now discuss my gimmick free team selection. I've got one key benching dilemma with the likes of Anthony Gordon, Chris Wood and Eze involved. The captaincy will be more open this week. And of course, where do I use my two free transfers? Do I roll? Those are the questions I will answer in the next section. I would love to go to a premium goalkeeper like David Raya or Allison, but I'm going to stick with Dean Henderson for now. There is a time and possibility where I will upgrade this position, but after two game weeks, I think it's far too early. I was never that keen on Dean Henderson, to be honest. He only kept four clean sheets last season, and Crystal Palace are known for their attacking prowess with Mateta, Eze, and at the time, Elise. And I'm not a big fan of their defenders for clean sheets. I like Munoz because of the assist potential. Joachim Anderson, when he was there, gave you a bit of goals, assists and bonus points and Mitchell is pretty decent as well but with Dean Henderson you're hoping for saves, the odd clean sheet here and there and I think a great opportunity will present itself in game week 4 against Leicester at home so the current plan is to keep Dean Henderson but going forwards I could see myself upgrading in this position particularly when I wildcard around game week 6 and beyond. I'm still fairly happy on my defensive line despite some teething issues. Trent Alexander-Arnold faces Man United away and even if Liverpool have gone the better of the Red Devils over the years, they can still struggle from time to time at that stadium and it happened just a few months ago and it was the start of Liverpool's downfall in the title race. So you can't discount Man United fully and they've been creating a lot of chances in the opening two games. They just haven't really taken them but they've got some quality players on the bench, especially in the winger position. So I wouldn't really count United as an easy fixture here but Liverpool are the favourites they've looked very impressive after the first two game weeks and I believe they will be in the title race this season I've always said this from the summer that I think they'll finish third minimum and that's still where I think they'll finish but I could be completely wrong they could easily punch above that and win the title if they carry on this form the fixtures are great and my prediction was for them to be top of the league after the first eight game weeks given their fixtures but the second defender I'm going for is Robinson away to Ipswich Town a clean sheet might not actually happen here because of the away fixture Fulham aren't that great defensively but Robinson can salvage something with an assist 
He got six last season, and of course in gimmick two, he delivered very well. And the bonus points can come from time to time, but for 4.6 million, you can't ask for too much here. And Robinson would be my favourite Fulham defender, with Joachim Anderson just behind him, and he will be around 4.4 million very soon in price. If you've got him, definitely hold Joachim Anderson, as discussed in my Trans Tips video and podcast. But finally... I've got a few defenders to choose from. Well, just two, actually. Lewis Hall and Mikalenko. And I'm going for the Evertonian, who picked up an assist in a 3-0 victory during midweek over Morecambe in the Carabao Cup. And I think Mikalenko can keep a clean sheet against Bournemouth, who have scored in both games so far, but just a one goal in gimmicks one and two. They signed Ivan Olsen, and they've got some good attackers, but Everton have a good home record against the Cherries, with several clean sheets in the last few meetings. I have even more squad depth in the midfield and forward line, starting with Diogo Jota against Man United away. A lot of his goals against the Red Devils have come at Anfield, but he has scored at Old Trafford in the past, including a 5-0 victory several years ago. I don't think that'll be the case this season, but Liverpool can win comprehensively there. They've got the quality and they've looked very clinical at times in the first two gimmicks. They are creating a lot of opportunities and looking dangerous, particularly on the transitions, and they're looking very organised defensively, especially compared to last season but my second midfielder is Saka at home to Brighton I am tempted to move him to Cole Palmer for the next four or five game weeks but I'm going to show you several transfer plans which could involve buying Salah in game week four during the international break and Saka would be the cash cow and the sacrificial lamb but I wouldn't necessarily sell him against Brighton although his record against the Seagulls isn't particularly great I don't believe he scored or assisted against them in home matches and Brighton can be a bogey team for the Gunners. It won't be easy whatsoever for Mikel Arteta's men, but they have signed Mikel Merino. Calafuri, of course, is already embedded within the squad and they could make one more key signing. And if they do sign that attacker, I think Arsenal are well poised to really challenge for the title and go all the way this season. My third midfielder is Emil Smith Rowe away to Ipswich Town. I think he'll build upon that goal and performance against Leicester City and he's going to do very well this season provided he can stay fit. Amongst budget midfielders, he is my favourite at the moment, but I also like Morgan Rogers, who has been very impressive in the first two game weeks, and Semenyo is very underrated at 5.5 million. He can play up front, but I wouldn't expect him to be out of position too often now with the signing of Ivan Olsen, and he would be third in my budget midfielders list in terms of those priced at 5.6 million and below. Smithrow would be top, and Rogers would be second at this moment in time. But my fourth and final midfielder is Anthony Gordon. The plan was always to start him against Tottenham. I could sell him in the coming weeks, especially after the international break. But my advice in terms of Gordon and Isak is don't sell them against Tottenham at home. They've got a great home record against them recently. They can score a lot of goals past them. And despite Tottenham being very impressive against Everton in game week two in that 4-0 victory, I still think they can be got at defensively. They've got some quality defenders on paper, but as a unit, I don't think they've got the protection in the midfield. And against these Newcastle attackers, they could really struggle. But based on the first two performances, you could also say Newcastle don't look quite at it. They're not really building a structure. The passes aren't really there and they aren't looking as convincing as last season or the campaign before that. But we're only two game weeks in, this could be the catalyst for Newcastle season, especially in such a big game. The home crowd are going to be absolutely roaring. You might laugh at this point because that would be three consecutive starts for Chris Wood in my FPL team. But in game week one, people said, don't start Chris Wood. He got me nine points, maximum bonus, and that goal against Bournemouth. Now in game week two, he was very disappointing and it was one of my regrets to start him over Anthony Gordon, but he's got a good home record against Wolves. In the Premier League, he has only blanked once in home matches and he also scored a hat-trick against them in an away fixture for his Premier League career. So I don't mind starting Chris Wood against Wolves at home, but he's very hit or miss. He's either going to deliver a big return, nine plus points, or be very disappointing and give you a one pointer after just really missing a lot of big chances as he did against Southampton. Now, my second forward, it's not for debate, Erling Haaland away to West Ham. He has scored in every single meeting against the Hammers, I believe, and his record at their stadium is particularly impressive. Three goals in two matches. His Premier League debut two years ago was made against West Ham in this stadium and he scored a brace. So I'm very happy to have Erling Haaland for the foreseeable future. And you can build a solid team with both him and Mohamed Salah within your ranks, as I'll show you very soon. And my third and final forward is Isak. Building upon what I said with Anthony Gordon, do not sell these assets in Gemic 3. That will be my advice. Maybe if they blank, you'll probably 
point the pitchforks at me and that's completely fair enough but based on recent data and their meetings with Tottenham Hotspur in home matches I really back Anthony Gordon and Isak or at least one of them to do very well so it's always going to be risky if you sell this quality of player even for the likes of Mbumo, Wissa and these quality assets in game week three. There's a lot to dissect here because I've got several issues in my squad and the current plan is to roll the transfer and have free available for game week four in the international break. Matthews, Eze, Hall and Barco are on my bench. My biggest concern is benching Eze and the same would go for if I benched Gordon or Chris Wood. A lot of the algorithm suggests benching Emil Smith-Rowe but I don't want to do that based on his form in pre-season, what he did in game week two and the fixture against Ipswich Town. And with Eze, I might find a way to sneak him into this team, probably over Chris Wood. And I'm guessing a lot of you in the comment section will probably recommend the same thing. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section and also on Twitter and Instagram. But in terms of the captaincy, I'm going to keep it very simple. Haaland has the armband and Saka has the vice. If I were to go for Cole Palmer, he would become my captain and I'm not going to discount that possibility whatsoever. But in the next section in Draft Town, I'm going to show you what they're suggesting for my FPL team and afterwards FPL.team, the website, a free resource, is very good for previewing your squad in future game weeks and I'm going to show you what I could do with free free transfers during the international break. Check out all the links in the description below as always and Draft Town is one of them. It's very easy to join. For as low as £2 per week, you can try it out and see what you think of all these different resources. My personal favourite is the player rankings, as I always say, but at the moment, their transfer suggestions include Mikalenko to Rico Lewis and Eze to Madueke. That is their top suggestion at the moment and their second one is Eze to De Bruyne and Isak to Welbeck. I actually like those transfers, especially in the short term and Danny Welbeck is a very good third option to have as your budget striker. Then they say Mikalenko to Gavardio and Isak to Welbeck once again and in terms of the optimization tool by clicking this green icon they recommend Mikalenko in for Hall, Sack as the vice, Haaland as the captain and Eze on the bench that's quite surprising I think Draft Hunt is the only algorithm to suggest Smith Rowe in my starting 11 with Fantasy Football Hub and FPL.team they all recommend benching Smith Rowe which I completely disagree with and that's what separates Draft Hunt from the rest so be sure to check it out there is a link in the description below and I'll probably put it in the comment section as well to make it even easier to find I've been using this for over a year it's very fun to use that's the most important thing but it gives you some very good data for all FPL players and clubs. You might be thinking, what on earth are you going to do with free transfers in game week four during the international break? Well, let's dissect that. Dean Henderson would still be in goal, but the back three could be Robinson, Nedeljkovic, a four million Aston Villa defender who should start week in, week out with Matty Cash injured for up to a month and Trent Alexander-Arnold. Now, you may also think, what about concert right back with Diego Carlos partnering Pau Torres? That is a possibility from time to time, but in his press conferences, Unai Emery really suggested that he would rather play Nedeljkovic in the right-back slot, and in the first two game weeks, who has come up for Matty Cash? Nedeljkovic himself. The five midfielders could be Rodgers, Smithrow, Jota, Salah, and Eze, with Haaland and Isak up front. The bench would include Matthews, Chris Wood, Mikalenko, and Barco. So I still have some big problems there, but I could buy Salah for Saka and also Morgan Rogers for Anthony Gordon. That would be the key cash cow, and Nedeljkovic would come in for Lewis Hall. Now, I could always buy Nedeljkovic for Barco, but in terms of money left in the bank and all the price changes we're seeing, it's going to be very difficult to achieve that. So it makes sense to sell one of Mikalenko or Lewis Hall for Nedeljkovic and then buy Morgan Rogers and Salah. I've only got 0 0.3 million left in the bank and just last night at 0 0.5 million. The price changes are very volatile at this point of the season and I would always recommend caution but people are still going to make early transfers and try to optimize their teams as quickly as possible and I understand that. I would love to do the same thing but I'd rather have more information. So during the international break in Gimmick 4, do not make early transfers because so much can happen in terms of players returning late, picking up injuries during their international duties. And in game week three, we've still got Carabao Cup games happening on Wednesday, the 28th of August. So try to be careful when making early transfers, sometimes chasing these price changes, 
can really benefit you in the long term, but it is a risky move. And that's why I always recommend a bit of caution when deciding your final transfers and the timing of them as well. Now in Gemic 4, of course, there's a long way to go. Until then, I might not even make these free transfers. But if I were to buy Salah, he would be my captain at home to Nottingham Forest. And then he's got Bournemouth in the following Gemic. Erling Haaland would be my vice. And I'd be very happy with this setup. A free 5-2 and I could always make a few other upgrades in the coming weeks. I think Chris Wood, Mikalenko, Barco would be on the chopping block, and maybe Eze if he doesn't improve as soon as possible in the Premier League. Thank you very much for watching this video and listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it or found it useful, then be sure to smash the like button and subscribe for new. Let's try to get this video to the 200 likes, and let's keep on pushing towards 35 subscribers and beyond. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram, DylanRCM, and check all the other links in the description below for my patron and the championships for early access to my videos, amongst many other perks, the Discord server, FPL League, Draft Town, as well as Spotify. Leave a five-star review on my podcast. It goes a long way to supporting my channel. I wish you all the best of luck for Game Week 3 and the rest of the season, and I'll see you next time.